Everybody, this is Tim Pichot, the Liberty Advisor, along with John Snice and the Economic Truth. And obviously, there's been a ton of stuff that's gone on in the financial markets the past week. Uh, so originally, we we're probably going to do these every two weeks. But obviously, with things uh, deteriorating as quickly as they are, we thought that it was important to get you guys the data as quick as possible. So I think what we're going to do to start off with here uh, is just kind of go over the past week and recap uh, the major markets. We have the Dow Jones finished down at negative 12.36. S&P is down 11.49. This is for the week. NASDAQ down 10.44. Uh, even gold down 3.57 at 1566. We've got silver at down 10%. Bitcoin down 11.9% for the week. We've got the 10-year treasury uh, sitting in at 1.163. And the 30-year treasury at 1.684. I mean, that, that is an absolute all-time low. Three month at 1.298. And then we've got oil all the way trading down at $44 a barrel. But I mean, to have a three month bond trading at 1.298 and having a 30 year bond trading at 1.684 just goes to show you that, uh, you know, things obviously are not going well. And just to let people know, the reason that happens, what we call an inversion in the yield curve, is that if people think that things are going to get worse and worse and worse, and they think that the, let's say they think that the Fed might uh, cut rates again, which I think at this point it's pretty much a given. If we think that, uh, you know, maybe we might even have negative rates. Then all of a sudden now, let's say, uh, let's say a year from now, if the rate's actually negative, so people would rather lock in 1.68. Now, I'm a, I'm a financial advisor, and uh, this is the one time that I actually say, like, you probably should not be buying 30-year bonds. And uh, if you are, you should come talk to me because there's much better things to do. But for the people, would, but people would rather just lock in, uh, you know, 30 years at one point, whatever it is, 1.684, then have to risk, you know, rolling over these short-term ones and all of a sudden their short-term ones turns into a negative. And then, you know, you're one of these companies over in Europe that are actually, the banks over there in Europe are actually just stockpiling actual physical cash because if they, if it costs them money to uh, give their money to the European Central Bank or Bank of International Settlements, then they'd rather just hold on to physical cash. And so they're actually running out of vault storage and, and it just goes to show how more uh, centralized planning has messed things up. Now there is uh, one investment out there that has done really well, and that's if somebody made a bet on the VIX, uh, the volatility index, that is that uh, skyrocketed all the way to uh, 40.11, up 23% for the week. And uh, Mr. Tim Pichel, yours truly over here, had uh, a put option portfolio that he bought, in, that my son, he uh, bought in January 15th. And uh, that, as of yesterday, was up uh, 181%. And what we used is we used that small portion of the portfolio to hedge against the market. And so we participated with the market going up last year. On average, our core stock portfolio was up about 25%. And then this year, uh, just spot checking clients are you know, anywhere from about uh, positive four to negative three year to date. And, that's, and a lot of them have had a lot of gold outside of the holdings they have with me. They have some Bitcoin outside of me. So if you actually count their, their full picture of their net worth. I mean, a lot of people are still sitting pretty because in the grand scheme of things, uh, Bitcoin still is doing pretty well uh, on a year. Yeah, and gold is up 22% on the year. <laughs> yeah, and gold is up 22% for the year. So, I mean, a lot of our clients are doing really well. Uh, not to make this big commercial, but we're taking a look. One of the things I saw yesterday, because John is always talking about the collateralized loan obligations, always talking about the uh, collateralized debt obligations, which... Uh, Probably doesn't make him a big hit at most parties, but you know, it's something that I like to talk <laughs> about. But uh, yeah, I was uh, perusing the Bank of International Settlements website because you know that's you know another another popular thing to do on a uh, you know Saturday night, and we see Basel Committee meets to review vulnerabilities and emerging risk, advance supervisory initiatives and proposal and and promote Basel three implementation. This is from the twenty seventh of February, so just a few days ago, and basically the main thing they wanted to meet about was the committee reviewed vulnerabilities associated with leveraged loans and collateralized loan obligations among financial participants. Banks have the largest direct exposure to these markets, blah, 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 blah. And so I'm not an expert in this, but the guy who is an expert on this is one of my best friends and co-host of the Tim and John show, John Styson. So if John, if you want to take us away and, and let people know what they, what a, maybe what a CLO is, what a CDO is, why people should uh, be concerned about this and, and some of the big uh, black swans that you see on the horizon associated with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So let's uh, let me share my screen here, uh, Tim. Just one second here. I'm gonna get the screen share up and going, and then you guys can actually see here. So just hold on a second. Uh, no, wrong. 
we're not going <laughs> to leave this meeting. Uh, okay, so if you take a look here, for example, we got uh, a report that just uh, came out. Well, it came out uh, for, and this is the report that came out for uh, the second, the first half of 2019. Uh, and it's uh, the, what is the report called? It's called the Securitize, uh, Securitization Data Report. And it's by SIFMA, which is uh, AFMA, actually, Finance of Europe. Uh, and they're actually uh, going through all of the information on uh, the issued uh, derivatives out there. And, and as you can see here, for example, you can see that uh, the derivatives uh, that have been issued here, uh, you can actually see the European derivatives is not even close to uh, high issues as for example the, the American uh, issues here you know used to basically uh, double here uh, we're looking no it's, it's not a double it's ten, tenfold of, of what the European uh, yeah, issues we all have are people are gonna be listening to this on a podcast so if you want to even kind of let, let people know about some of the actual numbers too in case yeah 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 the audio so just to give you an example here so just the first quarter of 2019 uh, it was issued in uh, in um, Europe. They issued thirty two point uh, four billion dollars. And when I say billion dollars, it doesn't sound like a trillion dollars. You hear about the derivatives. These are the underlying assets. These are the actual physical assets that get securitized uh, that are underlying to the CLOs that they sell uh, for you know mass market. <laughs> That's where you see you know the trillions come in. But the underlying assets uh, is, uh, was in the first quarter, 32 in Europe, and then in the second quarter, it was 60.7 billion. Uh, and for example, in the United States, it's as much as 364.7 in the first quarter, and then 439.2 in the second quarter. Now, the trend here, Tim, is actually showing a downward trend if you look at the 2018 numbers. And the first time ever there was a downward trend in the CDOs, remember the CDOs from back in 2018, you know, that had uh, underlying mortgages that, you know, went belly up, the ninja loans, basically. Uh, so you saw those going belly up uh, back in in 2008, and what happened was that in 2007 was the peak. 2008, it just went lower and lower in issuance because they collapsed basically. So what you saw is uh, we were seeing the trend now that there's a downward trend that is you uh, has been upwards uh, ever since. Um, you know, uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, 2010. You know, let me just go through some numbers there for our podcasters as well. So 2010, it was 1.24 trillion. Uh, then it went down a little bit in 2011. It was 10.06. 2012, uh, 1.60 and 1.56 trillion and 1.19, 1.74, 1.86, 1.89. Uh, and now you're seeing a downtrend in, in 2018, which is, was the highest year of issue in so far of uh, collateralized loan obligations but then 2019 seems to be uh, a year that's even going to be even uh, it's going to be lower for the, one of the first time i will sorry 2018 was the lowest year of issue in so these collateralized loan obligations so it, it's quite interesting to see um, the the downwards trend that is starting uh, starting right now uh, i also want to uh show you something else here which is quite interesting because this comes back to remember you know the big short movie where they're talking about the rating agencies and how the rating agencies you know were all colluding with the um, the financial institutions well me and tim on our last report if you if you uh looked at it me and tim actually it was it was very interesting we, we went through the the share price of moody's and the share prices just skyrocketed um, compared to the banks, for example, the banks, so most of the banks are down. I, I have uh, in my report, my 2020 global risk report, I have all the bank shares of the major banks and almost all of them, except for uh, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan was the only banks that actually have up uh, tick in, in share prices. Everybody else is basically uh, lower or uh, severely in the negative over the last 10 years. But this is interesting. So take a look at these stats here. Uh, in the issuance of triple A rated uh, rated derivatives, this is insane, Tim. Because even if the country has triple A rated uh, derivatives, really uh, the underlying assets from corporates and for everybody else should not be triple A. Like the nation is, you know, looked upon as a triple A rated uh, as a triple A rated uh, you know entity. Uh, and, and then everything else below that should be rated below 
uh, that of the, the, the actual that of the actual sovereign uh, sovereign nation. So when you take a look at like for example, the U.S. is still AAA rated, which is insane. Um, and and half of all of the investment grade bonds, which is triple B and above, over half of the investment grade bonds are right at triple B. And there's certain stats that are out there, which I went over my presentation uh, that, that I gave down in Acapulco, which I highly recommend you guys check out. But as part of that uh, presentation, we talked about, the, you know, that there, you can yeah. expect, you know, anywhere from like six, 600 to 800 billion dollars next recession to get moved from triple B down to double B, which will then create a cascading effect as these mutual funds and uh, different uh, yeah. index funds that are investment grade funds have to then force sell because those bonds will no longer be investment grade, which then creates more forced selling, which then creates a whole uh, basically cascading avalanche effect. And so what, what are you showing right now up on the screen? Well, I'm showing exactly what you're talking about, Tim. This is, this is interesting. So this is actually uh, the uh, uh, non-financial institutions, so not the basically corporations and their debt. And if you, if you take a look here, so we'll go to uh, just one second. So this is less than one year. Uh, and this is the actual credit rating for those corporates. And you can see here, Tim, what exactly you're talking. It's actually worse than what you're talking about right now. And these are, uh, the, these are uh, S&P uh, numbers, so Standard & Poor's own rating numbers. And that's uh, the that thing. A lot of times we paint a bad picture and a lot of times it ends up being even worse than what we, <laughs> we paint a very bad picture and a lot of times it ends up being even worse than we say. And so like we're not even, we're not even like fear mongering. It's, it's literally, usually we're not even painting the picture even as bad as we should be. But, you know, I'm not over here sitting here fear mongering because I <laughs> have made money throughout all this and I'm looking forward to everything going down to make even more money because that's the best time to invest is when there's blood in the streets, but you've got to have cash to be able to do it, but you just can't keep everything in cash or else that's uh, what I like to call going broke safely. So sorry, sorry about that. I'll let you. Uh, oh, no worries. No worries. No, it's a, it's interesting. Artem. So this is two years, of course, and you see there's basically zero uh, A-rated uh, issuances of corporate debt. And then if you go uh, to uh, two years, it gets a little bit better, actually, because it's probably more issuance of debt, uh, two to five years uh, that are issued in corporate debt. But still, you know, look at that big, massive, like even, even a rated below triple B, which is basically rated as junk, you have almost 50% of the corporate issuance is, is junk rated here. Uh, and then you go to um, uh, now we're at five to seven years. So you see the longer the years are here, the more like uh, the less likely the corporations start to pay their, uh, pay their bills according to the rating agency's own numbers. And now here you can see we're basically, uh, what are we at here? 50, 63, 70, no, uh, 67. We're 70, oh, about 70% of, uh, five to seven years of junk rated, uh, and then you go up to uh, you know seven to um, uh, seven to thirteen years on the issuance. Like now, you can actually see uh, the solvency. So basically, in uh, in default, the triple C rated is now ten percent of all that is uh, already in default, uh, and and that's a serious problem. And of course, it's now we're above seventy percent here. Uh, and, and the numbers of junk rated and the, the rest is triple B rated, which is, you know, just above junk. So, and take a look at here, like there's probably not too much issues that are between 13 to 20 years right now. So you're looking at all of it that is issued is triple B rated. Uh, and then there's nothing uh, more than 20 years. Now, I just wanted to show... Uh, and that is last... a very detailed graph. So for those of you who are yeah. listening, when John is clicking through and going through these infographics, everything is interactive. Everything is very intuitive. And, and that comes straight from your, your report, does it not? Yeah, this is my report. So my report is actually available for everybody that's on Discord or uh, want it. You know, it's uh, a D uh, so T-E-T. It's basically, you go to my website, you go uh, under my shop and you, uh, you look for the Global Risk Report 2020. And if you use uh, uh, my uh, coupon code TET, so uh, the economic truth, TET, you get 75% off of that report, which is set at 99% because it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of hours. I used uh, three months to put together all this information. And I, I think it's highly valuable for uh, most people that, you know, have investments th to make sure that, you know, what kind of risks are where, uh, are out there that they might not be seeing. In a, and, and then maybe, you know, uh, not, I'm not a financial advisor. So, of course, this is just my personal opinion and says that in the report. But at least it will give you uh, the tools to maybe take a look at, you know, what's happening 
uh, and how that could potentially affect your portfolio. Maybe you know make some changes based upon you know the data, just the data that I'm uh, I'm putting out there because this is just data from uh, S and P five S and well all all the major uh, indices out there all the major raging agencies, uh, there's numbers from Bank of International Settlements, IMF, everything. That's supposed to be, you know, official numbers, right, Tim? So we, we all know today yeah, and, uh, a and, lot of people we, are not And we sort of glossed over when we mentioned that the BIS was having this uh, like emergency meeting on CLOs and CDOs, but the BIS of Bank International Settlements, it's its own country inside of Switzerland. So it's sort of like the Vatican's own sovereign territory, the diplomatic community inside of there. And uh, it acts as the central bank for all the central banks. And so these are some very uh, important guys and, and, and mainly guys. Jabba. Too. Jabba the Hutt is over there. Or no, sorry, guy? Augustine Carsons. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, yeah, let's cut to a video. And that's, let me blow this video up. Yeah. Let me cut to a video. This is, this is the current head, which is actually, I think I believe it's the head of the Australian bank. I think his name is John Lowe. And, uh, and he's, now he's going to start talking about how Basically, the unconventional is now the conventional, which is something we, you know we have heard before. But here it is coming straight from the mouth. Of yeah. the, Do uh, I need to stop my sharing, Tim? You know, I think I can automatically just override you. Okay, perfect. Right. You've been, you've been yeah, overridden. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> unconventional monetary policy tools. It is. Clear. You know, can, can you can you hear that through yours? I want to make sure I. I yeah. Was, I yeah. Know, I, okay. I can. All right. Cool. That the innovations engineered by central banks in response to the great financial crisis. Engineered. Played a key role. <laughs> global economic recovery yeah, they, the global standpoint what does an assessment of these policies tell us about how they worked their positive and negative effects expected and unexpected consequences oh we've got nice Denmark. we've got nice soothing voices so you can trust us and just because we help fund the nazis doesn't mean that you shouldn't like us crisis created extraordinary challenges for central banks and required new policy approaches as conventional tools ran out of steam Many central banks introduced unconventional tools like negative rates and asset purchases, having had limited experience with how they perform in practice. Well, the committees looked at research, oh. central bankers, academics, and market practitioners for these complementary reports, which synthesized their views on the collective strengths and weaknesses. Oh, we have people that talk with such nice voices, but even though we help fund, literally 87% <laughs> of their funding in World War II came from the Reichsbank, Reichsbank being the bank that from the Nazis. And how do they pay them? They paid them their interest in gold. How do they get their gold? Uh, they stole it from the Jews. They stole it from raiding yeah. everybody else around. But, oh, we have nice, soothing voices. Yeah. We're just I, and actually, like a bunch of nerds. Yeah, and actually Basel III uh, made it made gold actually top tier one asset again, which it should have been all along. So basically, gold is money now. <laughs> so, what was the other one? Like the U.S., like the Federal Reserve? Now was that the other? Uh, no, the actual option? excessive reserves with the central bank, I believe, is also a top tier one asset, which is basically just digital fake money. You know, here, here's a here's an unconventional monetary theory. You know, like come on, yeah, yeah, print money. That's all you got to do. If, so for those of you on the, uh, on the audio right now, and if you are watching this on video, and I, for me personally, I watch very few videos, and mainly everything I do is listening in auditory. So, uh, you know, this is available too if you guys go to the website, and we'll probably have the links, links down below. But if you go to Tim Pichot, the Liberty Advisor, and right now almost everything I've done has been on audio as well. So John was having fun with his money cannon, shooting it at the camera. And uh, yeah, that's the, I guess that's, that's almost more just like a regular conventional thing now. I mean, that's his old Oh yeah, old exactly. News. There's, yeah, there, it's kind of old news. So, so sorry, sorry for that, Tim. That, they don't I even was, call I was it, wrong. Uh, <laughs> and then now it's not money printing because that's what we say it is. But even with this, I mean, the Dow falls 350 points Friday to cap the worst week uh, for Wall Street since the financial crisis. And when you think about this, um, I mean, what, I mean, at the very end of the market, I mean, it's just complete whipsaw. Oh, oh, they're trying to cut in. They don't. They don't agree with you, Tim. Okay, they're trying CM to tell yeah, us what's up, right. CM shut up, CNBS. You know, so that, <laughs> CM yeah, CNBC that was playing. Then we got other headlines here. CNBS. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been on the CNBS train for a while. But yeah, we got ex-Fed <laughs> Governor Warsh sees coordinated global central bank action soon in response to coronavirus. And I'll be shocked. I'm actually somewhat surprised that we haven't seen more action. Like, yeah, we did see the Fed. I mean, where is it? Somewhere on here. I mean, the Fed came out and said that they're going to do whatever it takes. But even with that, I mean, the market basically just completely, uh, completely just shrugged that off. And now let's go to the, to the pre-market action over here. 
see what's going on in the pre-market. So we've got the S&P 500 showing a slight Ooh. down. I mean, basically it's flat, but negative 2.82 implied open. So well, that uh, was the same. That was the same as it was last time, wasn't it? <laughs> Just okay. a slight down. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, so, but which I think last time it was like the S and or the uh, Dow was supposed to be down a hundred, and uh, right now it okay. shows the Dow down thirty eight. But I would expect to have a massive update uh, after. I mean, not that we have like too much really to go off of historical yeah, data to see. No, and if you actually go on historical data though, Tim, it usually there's actually if you go to uh, Wikipedia, there's actually like the biggest ups and down days in in history. And there you actually do find the biggest ups and downs comes uh, like through financial calamity. So we, we, it's weird that we haven't seen actually a big uptick yet, Tim. Uh, and that really surprises me heavily, to be honest with you, that it seems like it's just out of control right now. There's no way that they can, you know, con uh, contain this uh, this uh, downward trade it's right con now. It's contagion. There's lots of things that they can't contain right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah, the death contagion can't be contained anymore. And, you know, it's going to, well, it's basically has infected every human being on this planet pretty close uh, where everybody's indebted, you know, and everybody's going to die from like go bankrupt. That's basically the monetary death that's going to happen to everyone because we created these whole, uh, you know, fiat. You know, I, I believe the next thing that's going to come, Tim, is, you know, they're going to issue a new currency and say, like, no, this is not fiat. <laughs> well, and speaking of new currency, but some people, I mean, hopefully our listeners know this, but they're the, Bank of International Settlements has something that they trade in amongst themselves right now called the Special Drawing Right or the SDR. And it's uh, off the top of my head, it's about, I think it's about 50% dollar. It's probably about 30% euro and then maybe 5% the yuan, you know, some other little currencies like the Swiss francs sprinkled in there. The yeah. Japanese, just uh, just you know, one minute, Tim, just keep talking. I'll be right back. Okay. Well, so you interrupted me to tell me to keep talking. Okay, well that makes it that makes it a little bit tougher. So with the special drawing right, it, it they sort of that is what we're guessing is going to eventually be sort of the one world currency. So maybe you don't maybe you don't have maybe you still transact in your in your uh, actual country's uh, native currency, but it's tied to this SDR. So it's a fiat currency made up of other fiat currencies, and then you go back and take a look at what the. Uh, you go back and take a look at what the uh, so John right now is has a user's guide to the SDR. Is that one of the books that you got for like it was like a bajillion dollar book that you managed? Yeah, to, you know? five hundred bucks. This is like this is it. This so it, is co it cost you five hundred or you? Yeah, uh, yeah. This is this is like a book out of a library, as you can see here. It was a uh, Hartford Graduate Center that it came out. <laughs> somebody somebody took it out of the library uh, because this is actual this is the actual, this is the actual manual that the Treasury Secretary of any country would have. This uh, this same manual is actually <laughs> that's, that's, that's just, pretty sweet. That's probably gonna be uh, yeah. worth some money someday. If, if it's one of the few big like awesome books that I have. I also have one on the uh, on the exchange stabilization fund that the United States has. So it's it's just like a, a collector's item for us economic geeks there. And this is actually like from 1995. It shows that it was put into the library. So it's very, very interesting. But Tim, I, I just want to, because we kind of interrupted a little bit into what we were talking about with the derivatives. I, I don't want to know if you want to uh, let me just get a little bit back into it uh, quickly before we uh, kind of put an end to like talking about all yeah, this derivative yeah, stuff. Because I, yeah, because I, I think that there's a couple more numbers that we need to go through here uh, quickly before we uh, kind of end the whole, like, you know, derivatives are insane in the first place. But we can talk a little bit about uh, more about uh, the derivatives uh, after this. Well, I'm going to show you a couple of more charts. And here is one chart uh, that, of course, uh, indicates what I showed above, uh, which shows like the speculative grade rated versus the uh, non-speculative grade. So you can see deterioration in the, the underlying collateral and the actual valuation of it. So you can see there's only like investment grade now is 21.41% of all issued debt in 2018. Uh, and it's, you know, down from like right in 2010, which was the year after the financial crisis uh, hit, hit its worst, you know, it, the investment grade was at 72.73%. So you can kind of see a, a, a massive, you know, collapse here in itself. And then if we go down here, Tim, we're going to show our viewers a chart that's just going to really, uh, well, actually, it's the same chart as uh, the Federal Reserve uh, had on their website. Uh, and I think they got the numbers from the same exact place that I have. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, looking through. This, these are all the banks here. Uh, I think I'm still at the banks. Hold on there. 
sorry about my little delay here. I'm just pull, uh, basically I'm I'm gonna show you uh, the chart about derivatives here in one second. And yeah, here it's coming. Um, so here you can see uh, one more up here. Sorry guys for keeping you delayed here. Uh, yeah, this is this is the chart here. This is like an amazing chart that just shows you how crazy the, the issues of collateralized loan obligations versus the, the collateralized debt obligations uh, that was issued back in 2018, uh, known in 2008 crisis or pre 2008 crisis. As you can see, you know it hits its peak here. For, well, let people know for the people that are listening. So we've, so we've got two different graphs here. One's the CLOs, yeah. one's the CLOs. yeah one. Yeah, one is the CDOs, one is the CLOs. And the CDOs there, you could see it hit the peak in 20, 2007. Uh, it hit its peak in issuance. And as you can see, uh, you know, it was 140. Uh, let's let the people who can't see, let the people who are, who are listening to it right now, let them know. So we've, it's just like a gigantic, yeah. like like uh, like you're going on a roller coaster all the way up, right? Yeah, it's, a, the, it's, up. it's the hockey stick moment uh, that they tried to do with climate change. You know, this is the real climate change here, boys. Uh, this is the financial climate change, if you can call it that. Uh, the temperature of the financial market is basically boiling over here with all the sea low issues. And it's ridiculous. Like the number of... Uh, uh, CDOs that were issues at the peak of the market in 2007 was $148 billion. And if you take a look here, it just takes off. And actually, the CLOs was issued as well back here in 2007. They actually peaked out at 291.4. Uh, but then it just took off. Basically, it was just corporate loan. Uh, it was driven. Uh, what has been driven by? It's been driven by share buybacks, Tim. And, you know, talking about the stock markets, you know, the massive blow up. This is what's been driving because the share buybacks has been fueled by uh, corporates, you know, taking on a whole bunch of debt, then buying back their own shares with that debt. And so basically it's just pure financialization. Nothing of real value is created. And it's totally insane. Uh, but at the peak now, this is 2019. Uh, so far in 2019, I don't have the full 2019 numbers yet. But in 2019, it was uh, as much issued as $605.8 billion worth of these. So it's about five, almost five times more um, uh, of issuance of, uh, of the uh, collateralized loan obligations versus the, the CDOs. Uh, so it's, it's pretty insane, just that number. And then if you bring it back to, um, uh, if you go up here, Tim, I'm gonna, just going to show you one last thing from my report. Too. This, uh, I feel there's a lot of good tidbits here uh, and a lot of good charts. I actually had James Turk kind of getting back to me. He really liked the report. I had a World Bank economist saying uh, that my report was fantastic. Let people know, I mean, James Turk, he's the founder of uh, Gold Money. I think he's been in the space for a long time, just absolute OG in the precious metal space. So I mean, this is a big time guy, also one of the... Uh, headliners of the tv summit at uh in Arcapoco. so very uh big time guy and he had a lot of good things to say unfortunately yeah. i messed up the interview we did with him so we'll have to get another <laughs> one with him because the audio didn't come through but uh we might yeah. play that at a later date if i can salvage any of that yeah and and here tim th this is the funniest thing so l let's go take a look at these uh share buybacks here so uh you see some uh you know number uh, some names that are quite familiar you know mastercard did they uh Eight billion, so that was two point seven percent of their shares in the in a buyback. You got Newmont. Uh, let's see if there's any other uh, ones that you recognize here, Tim. Uh, sorry, I'm just taking a little while to uh, go through them. Chubb Edwards is a massive infrastructure company. Uh, there is uh, if we go down I think, here, I think, I think that's the insurance. I think that's the insurance company, Chubb. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's like a sec one of my yeah. friends, uh, I think his sister works for them. So and actually Warren Buffett, I think is tied to that company as well. Oh, too. Of course. <laughs> and then he got Intel bought 8.7% uh, of the shares uh, Two, And this is an additional one. So you can see here, this is throughout the year of 2019. They actually did twice uh, a share buyback. And this was in October. They probably did one earlier as well. Uh, so just to show you, you know, Black & Decker, Microsoft, uh, Oracle, uh Callaway, the the golf manufacturer. Do you have a G, do you have, GE on, do you have GE on there by any chance? Uh GE. <laughs> well, we got Wells Fargo here talking I'm about looking, Wells I'm Fargo. Looking them up right, I'm looking them right up right now. So GE yeah. spent uh and this is from an article back in 2018. So they had spent $24 billion on buybacks, averaging at yeah. $30 a share. And there's today, another Wells Fargo buyback. 
So today, today they're trading at ten dollars and eighty-eight cents a share, and they spent twenty-four billion at an average share price of thirty dollars. So, not a great use of uh, investor capital. Buying well, and, and you got to remember, like the, the whole downturn team, in my point of view, started when they started their financial lending arm. You know, G Capital. I think that was the biggest mistake that they could ever have done. But you see that with all these corporations that are out there because people can't buy their products, you know, like Home Depot, we got Canadian Tire in Canada, uh, Best Buy. Almost everybody has now a, a, a credit card attached to their corporation. So they're basically become money lenders because nobody can afford their products with the current salaries. So they have to go into debt and, and basically massive, you know, 19 to 23% uh, interest here. So Apple, Costco, uh, you know, everybody is, everybody's involved in Ally, uh, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, so yeah, Best Buy. It would be, at this point, it'd probably be quicker to name the uh, big S&P 500 companies that aren't doing massive share buybacks because I mean, basically <laughs> they, they all yeah. are. And that, so what, so what, yeah. so kind of like at a higher level, what's going on here is that let's say, let's say you make a million dollars a year and you have a million shares outstanding. So you're, right now, your earnings per share would be one dollar. So you're making a million dollars. You have a million dollars a share. So you take, you know, the amount you have outstanding versus the amount of shares or the amount of money you made. You got one dollar a share. Now let's say you, you still make a million dollars, but you're able to buy back ten percent of your shares. So let's say there's nine hundred thousand shares now instead of having a million. Well, now your earnings per share would actually go up. I mean, I don't know, like one point one. So you, you know, you're looking at one point one a dollar ten earnings per share instead of having. Uh, $1 per share, but you didn't earn any more money. You just have less shares now outstanding. And I made a joke about this the other day on uh, another podcast I did where, where uh, I was saying, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, like in Bitcoin, it was a crypto podcast. I'm like, it's sort of like uh, in Bitcoin, I guess when you have Peter Schiff, when he ever loses his password, and now all of a sudden all those Bitcoin are now gone. And so now it would technically relatively make the rest of the Bitcoin market even more scarce. Uh, but you know, whenever we can make a kind of rib on Peter Schiff, we like to do that. Even though I do agree with a lot of his economic analysis, just not necessarily how to trade it, and obviously nothing on the, uh, the crypto side of things. No, and that, that's where actually James Turkey he, he does promote crypto and buying crypto because he understands it. He is actually one of the old guys that actually have uh, you know looked into it and and taken some interest to it. And uh, but then again, gold money though they don't actually really take they they I believe they use BitPay. And so if you let's say give them uh, ten thousand dollars in Bitcoin, they're actually then turning around and then selling that and then getting the fiat, which is actually a smarter way to do it if if you know your clients do have Bitcoin because you're yeah. paying a lot less than you do on a credit card. It's uh you know instantaneous. Just a much better way to do that. But also, uh, also his like portfolio that he was showing when he did the presentation had, I, th I believe it was like five or ten percent crypto in it. So actually, he is promoting you know holding crypto as well on top of you know buying the, the their gold, which you know again you know I'm I'm not a big fan of uh, you know gold that is traded with something you might have it or you might not have it. You know don't know exactly if you have it and so on, right? So. I, I'm always a fan of holding the physical thing in my own hands, you know, being able to access it at any time. Uh, they might be, you know, storing it in some gold wall, but still, you know, even but that. Got, but is, if you've got millions yeah. of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, I mean, especially in silver, I mean, there's, it's very hard to hold on to hundreds of thousands of dollars of silver without, without worrying oh, about coming into the house yeah. and breaking it. So, I mean, yeah. there's, it's not, uh, you know, there's pros and cons for, for everything. Oh, so that's, that's the thing 100%. to uh, to understand with, with, with all this stuff. Oh, 100%, Tim. And, and that's the reason why a lot of people, you know, want to have it uh, accessible at a Brinks or at the other storages around the world, of course. Uh, and uh, I think Gold Money, they have like Toronto, they have Singapore, they have something in New York, I believe. So they have it like spread out. But Tim, uh, I just wanted to, before we get all done, uh, I still got some interesting uh, CLO stats here. And this is, these stats are actually from uh, none other than the Federal Reserve's own website here, as you can see. Uh, it's the federalreserve.gov uh, website. And who owns uh, US CLO securities is the, the, the article there. And as you can see here, this is very interesting. So you have uh, the uh, uh, top uh, holder of it, it's actually insurance companies. Tim, Tim, being an insurance company, isn't it being very conservative uh, the most important thing? Like, is is really like holding a CLO derivative very conservative for a for a financial insurance company? 
I don't, I don't know. If they're, this is just my. Uh, well, I mean, I don't my, know what they're if they're using it to to hedge different bets, but then if they're hedging bets, then you have to then wonder if if that's actually counterparty risk that can be paid off. So if you go back to two thousand and eight. And then you had, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs were selling this, but they were in their own words saying, you know, we need to get this dog shit off our books. And they were talking about this investment, I believe it's called Abacus. And so that, then I believe they sold that to AIG and then AI, well, then they went and then bet against the same thing that they sold to AIG. And then AIG, when they went under, then couldn't pay Goldman Sachs. But then luckily the treasury secretary at the time, Hank Paulson was former Goldman Sachs. And then uh, and he was replaced by Timothy Geithner, who was, you know, very close with Goldman well, yeah. Sachs as well. And so so then essentially Goldman, so AIG got bailed out so that way they can pay Goldman Sachs, which that, and then, you know, then we helped get Trump in the office. So then that way he could then surround himself by people from Goldman yeah. Sachs, like Steve Mnuchin, who is now uh, the treasury secretary, who also is, uh, you know, now part of the new coronavirus task force. And, <laughs> and along with Larry Kudlow, the chief economic advisor are yeah. two of the key guys in the economic, uh, the coronavirus task force. And, Everything they're doing is just engineered to try to game the stock market going up and up and up. But, you know, everything is good money after bad. Uh, it's, it's funny. Speaking of good money after bad, I'm actually looking at uh, Drudge right now, the Drudge report, and it's saying that Tom Steyer spent $3,373 per vote and earned zero delegates. So maybe he is, maybe, maybe he is pretty qualified to be the next president because, uh, you know, here he is wasting all that money. on. Uh, and I guess speaking of wasting money, you got Bloomberg up there too, Mini Mike. Spent uh, you know half a billion dollars to go to his own roast and get absolutely nothing accomplished, and uh, we did have also Joe just kind of getting a little bit sneaking in some geopolitics here. Joe Biden ended up uh, winning big yesterday. Uh, I think he got like where is it like forty nine or fifty percent of the vote. I think Bernie Sanders was at like nineteen. I'm just trying to scroll down here. Yeah, forty eight point six for Joe Biden, nineteen uh, point nine for Bernie Sanders. And Tom Steyer at eleven point three. But you know, and then I also saw something where the African American vote for uh, what's his name? Biden was huge. It was like 40, 50 percent, even though he's the guy who uh, basically helped author the 94 crime bill and the 94 drug bill, which, uh, you know, essentially devastated the black and minority communities. But, you know, hey, you know, he was with Obama. So that's uh, I guess everybody everybody cares about over there. And so what do we got? What do we got pulling up over here on, on screen? I, is it Deutsche well, Bank or is it? Well, so so this is interesting. This is remember we were talking about uh, the actual. Uh, we were talking about the actual, um, um, you, you were talking about AIG uh, falling down and th that was caused by something called a credit default swap because AIG, uh, they were doing these insurance products, which is, uh, th so this is interesting. Let me just quickly tell you the story. So who invented the credit default swap was actually Black Masters, of J uh, former JP Morgan, <laughs> uh, which, you know, was, that was over there, you know, Cor she also- and then She went on to go work yeah. in crypto and I think just got out of some crypto, but yeah, yeah. No, she, was, she was working <laughs> for some sort of crypto company, but anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, she, she's a really evil lady. And, um, but she, I, the reason why it was called a credit default swap and not credit default insurance was because they wanted to uh, not go under regulation of insurance uh, or being a part of insurance. So basically they created the, the credit default swap being a insurance product, but now instead of, you know, you just insuring your own thing once, uh, it's like basically uh, a CDS is basically a thousand people insuring uh, my house and then it burns down and the insurance company doesn't have the money because over a thousand people insured the, the one house. <laughs> and that's what happened with the CDS. And here uh, I'm just showing you for this is from uh, Europe. This is the uh, Bursh, uh, Rama over there. They have all the derivatives tradings uh, of all Europe. Uh, but this is the Deutsche Bank five year credit default swap. So you could buy. Uh, a five-year credit default swap. The, it costs whatever they call it basis points. That is the cost to actually insure it. Uh, but here you can see it actually peaked. This is uh, back in uh, in mid uh, 2019. But it was also all the way up back, um, I believe, in 2018. It hit like 250 or something. Uh, now, of course, it's very little risk. But suddenly you seem to see the peak up in risk here again of, of this credit default swap. So it costs uh, it's starting to cost more more again to actually insure against uh, Deutsche Bank failures because Deutsche Bank went up in price, but now the problem is they, they <laughs> drastically went down in price again when you had the, the whole collapse, which, you know, the German stock markets, well, what are they down now? Let's uh, have a quick look here. The German stock market, the DAX is uh, down about the same as the United States uh, Dow Jones. It's 12.44%. Uh, 
so it's it's very heavily it's it's getting uh, of course hit uh, a lot of it is uh, the industrial side because uh, Germany like uh, the the major corporations there like Bayerische Motorwagen and, and Audi and all these guys are very reliant on Chinese uh, investments. Uh, but if you if you go and take a look here, so you look at year on year return. Uh, you'll find, uh, let's see here, if you go down, here's Deutsche Bank here. So Deutsche Bank hasn't lost too much, but they were all the way up at 10 euros uh, per share here, but now they're down at 7.88 again. So they're they're moving downwards again. They're actually uh, starting to get in trouble here, I believe, because I think the technical level was 6%, uh, the, no, 6, sorry, 6, uh, six, year, um, six euros. So here, uh, let's pull up the chart here so just can show you. Uh, how the share price is. Uh, we're gonna even go to old time here and show you the old time chart, whatever data they have, the data back, all the way back here, let's, just one second. It's uh, February 1st, 2000, uh, that they have the data from. And as you can see, you know, it's, the share price has, you know, dropped uh, drastically, you know, from from the 2000s here. Uh, it was even, you know, it was up at 60. Uh, what is that, Tim, for a drop? If you look at even just 60 euros and drop it down to 7.88, that's almost like 90% drop, isn't it, Tim? Uh, I believe, right? So uh, it, it's just an insane uh, drop. And of course, yeah, Deutsche Bank exactly is, 90%, yeah. yeah, and Deutsche Bank is the actual derivatives arm of JP Morgan in Europe. And they have, you know, four, uh, 43 trillion-ish uh, on their balance sheet of derivatives that are still laying there, which is, you know, mass amount, like, I believe that the GDP, the total uh, size of the, uh, the German economy, I think it's, don't, uh, don't get me, uh, uh, it's probably wrong, but I think it's somewhere between five to seven trillion. So it's like most stats. So it's like most stats then. Okay, if it's probably wrong, but I think it's also <laughs> yeah. important to point out that the yeah. German economy they have a very very old uh, demographics over there. So I mean, the average age of their workers is very very old, and so not a lot of people to be able to replace them. And then when your entire economy is on based on a Ponzi scheme like it is here, like it is over there, that you always need more and more young blood, which is that was one of the reasons why they were trying to mm -hmm. flood in all the migrants. So then that way they could have you know, all these younger um, migrants who that, that way they can then, you know, get in the vote a certain way and use them just like they use over, you know, over here in America, different, uh, you know, ref ref refugees, not trying to make this all political, but I mean, there are demographic reasons for why a lot of this stuff is going on. And I was trying to pull up the clip and I forgot the actress's name, but it was the movie, The Big Shore. And I, I think she used to be, um, you know, married to or, play, or played a part with uh, Ashton Kutcher, but I can't remember the, uh, the, the girl's name. But anyways, they were at a, they're at a card table and it shows two people playing, uh, playing blackjack. And then and it goes, they're trying to explain what a credit default swap was. And goes, now let's pretend that you and I are betting on who those two. So we got two, so let's say John and I are playing a game and then you've got, you know, somebody else who's, who's watching us play a game. Now it'd be the two people who are watching us play a game they go and make a bet on, on the outcome of the game that John and I are playing. And then you have people who are making bets on the people who are making bets on, on <laughs> the outcome of John and I playing a game. And then you got people who are making bets on the people who are making bets on the people who are making bets. And that's sort of what the credit default swap is, is that it's all these intertangled web that there's absolutely no way to actually accurately forecast how intertwined and interwoven all these different uh, well, uh, intricacies of this are. Yep. Yeah, Tim, in, in 2013, the Cyprus bank failure, Larnaca Bank and uh, Bank of Cyprus, that was actually a derivatives bet uh, that they used credit default swaps to bet against uh, the Greek debt. But then, of course, the Greeks got bailed out by uh, the ECB. And, and, and talking about, the, you know, uh, corpora, uh, corporations, because we're talking about like corporate debt terror, that's the CLOs, that's the underlying assets in most of the CLOs. And just take a look at, uh, this is the ECB's balance sheet here. And if you take a look, the, the number is just ridiculous in the amount of, um, hold on here, uh, it's called AC, so Securities of Euro Area Denominated Residents. So basically resident is also a corporation because corporation and person is the same thing, right? So you can see they hold $1.16 trillion worth and you can see a massive, 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 uh, buy up of these debt that are, you know, the, the whole Eurozone has not grown at all. Uh, and you're seeing, uh, of course, the banking system there, you know, especially Deutsche Bank, uh, Commerce Bank, uh, uh, Societe Generale, uh, ABN AMRO, 
uh, you see Banque Populaire, you see uh, uh, Unicredit, and all, all these banks around in Europe are really struggling right now. Uh, and they're, you've seen actually in Italy is one of the worst, actually, where they're doing a whole bunch of bank mergers. But the thing is also, Tim, as you said, you know, the, the, the whole demographic cliff, we have that in most uh, modern Western countries. Uh, and the problem is that even, even on top of, you know, having more people needing to feed into the system that you're saying, who's going to buy uh, the assets that they need to sell off uh, the, the baby boomers to retire, Tim, as well? Think about that, right? So uh, that's another thing, you know, who's going to buy the houses that are super overvalued that, you know, I think it was a, some, somebody saying that the house is now 14 times more expensive than it was back in the day. And of course, salaries hasn't increased 14 times. Uh, it's been a lot more stagnant than that. So you're seeing a lot of big problems around the world with these uh, demographic issues that are underlying. And of course, that those create, uh, on top of that, create pressures, you know, that are deflationary to the economy. And deflation, you can't have that uh, with any central banks around the world, Tim, right? So it's just, uh, it's just a, uh, we're in a uh, death spiral that is, you know, fighting, get, it's like two tectonic plates. We got one, I'll, I'll get you to your book there, but it's two tectonic plates. You know, we got deflation and inflation and they're just, uh, you know, pressuring on each other and suddenly you get a 10.1 earthquake that's going to, you know, eviscerate the earth while, uh, you know, it's either of them is going to win. And I believe inflation will win because Ben Bernanke in 2002 said that, oh, no, we can, you know, uh, understand well, as that long as the tectonic the plate will win as long as the tectonic plate sends california into the ocean uh, and gives me some beachfront property in arizona then i think that'd be a, a big win for <laughs> all terrible. humanity if california just actually but hopefully not uh, in two weeks from now when i'm gonna be well out. poor poor g edward griffin do you, our our uh, big guy be a g edward griffin lives in california come on you can't be that evil poor guy uh you know what he could you know what? he could take you know he's about 88 years old he could take a hit for the team if he's you know, <laughs> that, you know i mean there's enough, well, there's enough now, now tim is getting really terrible every we, we should really, probably quit right away because no, tim is, yeah <laughs> but anyway what Speaking, we've got speaking of demographics. Here's a book I read yeah. a, a while ago called The Demographic Cliff, and uh, you know, essentially, it goes on to say, you know, the average person in at least in America spends the most in their lifetime at age 46. Take a look at the baby boom. It happened. The baby boom was from 1940s. I believe it was from 19. Where was it? I think it was from 1942. I believe is when it first started. Yeah. So I mean, it, or sorry, it was 1946. And so if you add, you know, 1946, and then you add 46 years to that, you get 1992. That's right when. Bill Clinton was coming into office. And so essentially Americans were hitting their peak spending. A lot of the spending was uh, that a lot of the economic boom that we saw was not only because of the invention of the internet, you know, thanks to Al Gore, uh, obviously kidding. Uh, you know, it was really Joe Biden. He's you know, Joe Biden is responsible for everything that's ever been done. If you've ever listened to any of the debates, uh, but really you know, all kidding aside, the baby boom then peaked out uh, in from their peak spending years actually in 2008 that's right when you know obviously we had the 2008 down uh you know financial crisis and uh that whole thing ended up getting papered over and they realized there's this huge demographic problem i mean just go back to social security there used to be i believe 164 four people paying in for every one person collecting yeah. now it's like basically two to one and so eventually it's going to be one to one and i was you know sort of in jest saying this i'm like well maybe all the coronavirus could be a you know, a good thing for the economy if it only kills off 70 and 80 year olds who are trying to get social, trying to get social security, because then that's like the only way we can fund this stuff. And I'm, I'm, I mean, guys like Bill Gates say this stuff and they get, you know, cheers on TED Talks. Uh, and so I'm just you know, trying to make some gallows humor out of yeah. what's going on. And obviously, I love G. Edward Griffin and he's, you know, I've mentioned him probably 10 times a day and I've got his book signed behind me. And, uh, you know, he's, you know, one of the main mentor and, and all, I want to say not like direct mentor, but you know, one of the guys who I referenced the most, but uh, anyways, uh, you know, hopefully it's just, I guess he's, uh, he's not Southern California though. Is he, is he more Northern middle? Well, he, he's more up in the, uh, yeah, he's more up in the mountains in Paso. That's what, but yeah, he, we're also talking, yeah, lives, we're talking about LA. he also live, but he also lives in Thousand Oaks though, which is right by LA, unfortunately. So that's his uh, okay. main residence. <laughs> well, we'll get him off in a helicopter before that. Yeah, but, yeah, we'll go and um, we'll go and grab it. But as you can see here, Tim, you know, uh, if anybody's paid attention to my hat, I don't think we talked about it. But you know, we were talking about what a lot of people might call a black swan event. But the the thing is, like a lot of these black swans are totally predictable as well. Um, I I think you know the sea lows and everything has just been a massive buildup of unsustainability. And of course, it's going to come down really hard when it, when, it, when it does happen. 
and when nobody is going to be able to get their collateral up because if the collateral dries up, the underlying collateral in these things, you know, uh, dry up, there's nobody that could pay their debt anymore of these corporations because they're zombies already. And then suddenly you get the coronavirus hitting now. Well, I just uh, think there's yeah. one, the Bank of International Settlements, here they are meeting on this week where all hell is breaking loose. And what are they ta they're talking about? The stock market, they're talking about the bond market. What are they talking about? They're talking about CLOs. They, they, yeah. They, yeah, everything is just fucking collapsing. And that's the one thing that they're talking about. And that's the one thing that John's been screaming about. And to my, to his credit, I haven't really been talking too much about CLOs. I mean, I'm talking about the corporate debt, uh, triple Bs. and But which is underlying. Like that's underlying yeah. all the CLOs, right? So that's, so there's that's, like 20 yeah, different that. black swans that could be unleashed <laughs> at any time. And the real black swan was the coronavirus that then uh, was just helped yeah. expedite every, all the other, basically it was an ignition switch to all these others. And, uh, you know, I'm not really super worried about the coronavirus, but if the thing is sometimes perception is, is not, not sometimes perception. Hey, if, if the coronavirus hits, that's all you need. <laughs> free cash, yeah, free, cash free cash for cash. everyone. But, uh, no, we do appreciate everyone that's watching. I always see at least seven people watch now on the, uh, Tim show with the Liberty Fantastic. Advisor channel. This will probably be on uh, world alternative media later on. So if you guys want to make sure that you, that we're always going to be live. Uh, we want to make sure you catch all of our live stuff. Make sure you join our Discord, which uh, you can find that. Uh, you can also find that at the Temperature with Liberty Advisor. We'll have that linked uh, in the in the comment section or in the description below. Because uh, you know John is pretty active on there. If he wants to, uh, are you are you sharing the screen right now so you can show people? Hey, yeah, as you playing? can see, this is our Discord channel, so you can kind of see like we we, uh, we actually oh there's somebody new joining right now. Fantastic, Anthony, welcome. That's uh, that's great news. Uh, as you can see, we're, we've been discussing, I'm just going to go up here. We've been discussing shortages that are starting to happen in the United States where people plan, uh, are panicking. You know, I'm getting a lot of Facebook commercials for uh, mouth, uh, mouth bands now. Uh, what do you call mouth masks now? <laughs> for yeah, the the coronavirus. Mask, like the N95 mask. Yeah, they're, they're selling that like crazy right now. Uh, and they're trying to push that on me, of course, because I, I I've been posting a bunch. Let's of go to the let's go to the the article section too, because I mean that's yeah. Where so got so this is like you you could see we've been talking here, we've been discussing uh, what's happening with S and P, what's happening in markets. But this is the coolest one. So me and Tim, we are always like every almost every day, I would say we uh, <laughs> me and Tim are. <laughs> now this is a little bit different. Now of course it shows this one. So <laughs> most of the stuff is not most of the stuff is all financial geek economic stuff. But I, this yeah. one is, I put there because I thought it was funny. And it shows that there's 119 people that are quarantined in a brothel in Spain because I guess one of the uh, female talent got diagnosed with coronavirus. And so they Somebody's just unlucky. They're in place. So I'm sure there's a lot of guys who are uh, in pretty big trouble right now. Who? <laughs> That's terrible. How come daddy didn't hilarious. come home? Oh, he's locked in. Jeez. And so what we do, so I, so I, yeah. you know, I getting sick of, uh, you know, Facebook and different social media sites. And so I, when I go through, I save something, I save it to Evernote, then Evernote then shoots it over to this article section of discord. And, uh, you know, John is probably shooting over 20, 30 things a day. I'm probably yeah. shooting over about a dozen or so. And then it also creates a repository where we can then see what things later on, and especially inside my own Evernote. So that way I have it because a lot of these things, I mean, Google it makes it so that way you can't even search for things anymore because the things oh for sure so this, this is perfect find. actually having that we basically have a massive archive that you can search up you could search up all the way to the back if you want uh, in this archive and it's fantastic so you could see all the articles we could pull everything up actually i was scrolling at him look at this article that are that they're just trying to pull through now in legislation in uh, in uh, australia which is insane they're banning cash they want to ban physical cash payments uh over ten thousand dollars in in uh in um uh, in australia which is just just getting crazy uh but this is what they want though they want to ban cash because if they can ban cash they can go negative because now everybody's stuck in the the banking system none of our money is your ours anymore and the banks control then they every can tie single it with a social aspect. credit and they can tie it with social credit. And then, yeah. then at that point you're checkmated and then they all, well, I guess they also need the guns too, but you know, they're, they're trying hard in that one too. So, Oh, hundred percent. No, it's, it's those two things. It's like cash is actually privacy right now, even though that you might hate, you know, uh, we might actually hate uh, the, the whole system itself. Uh, and uh, you know, this like fiat currency, but still cash actually provides, uh, you know, a privacy for people because it can't be really tracked at all. And we mentioned uh, that the big banks are over in Europe are hoarding cash and, and buying out all the vaults because right now they get, they have to pay money if they keep their cash at the uh, bank of, or the ECB. 
Whereas if they just have their own warehouse, they have to, there's embedded cost to that too. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I actually have that in my uh, in my presentation that I did in Acapulco, uh, just showing. And of course, when Switzerland went to uh, to negative seventy five percent, no zero point seventy five percent, they actually uh, everybody was hoarding cash in the vaults to get away gold and silver. Uh, so it's just like un unattended consequences that they don't really want to have happen. Uh, these banks because they need to ban cash. They really need to ban cash because if they don't ban cash. Uh, they're gonna have a serious problem, uh, and uh, you know that's that's where we're all going here, Tim. It's it's towards that. If if we they don't, should ban, you know, they should just ban the uh, coronavirus, and then yeah, then it would just stop all the coronavirus. But we probably do have to get going yeah. soon because I've no, got another sure. yeah. another uh, interview coming up at once. So I gotta make sure this. Yeah, and we're we're out. over an hour now, aren't we, Tim? So uh, I think we still have four know. minutes, so we can shoot it shoot the breeze for another three minutes. But anyways. Uh, I also want to get this one up on World of Turn of Media. Yeah, I'm gonna well. stop my. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here for a second, and then go back to us here. No. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's pretty interesting, Tim. You know, follow us on the Discord channel because that's where we really are creating a great community now. Uh, you can ask questions. You know, if you have them, uh, and and then Tim could get back to you uh, with you know advice later on. He can't, of course, add you know say anything directly on the chat, but he can you know. Uh, get in touch with Tim there and uh, you could get a lot of great information from Tim that he could help you with, of course. Uh, so it's, it's a great uh, way for everybody to stay connected. And of course, a lot of the people that are connected on, connected on there too also are super interested in talking money and economics. So we're kind of creating a, a community of like-minded people there as well that really wants to understand money and economics to them. You know, we got some bigger name people yeah. already in the community. I mean, like Anthem Blanchard's in there. Yeah, and then we got uh, Chris Chris Karabats, of course, is a great guy, a fantastic guy as well. Uh, I think we're, tr uh, we're trying Nimitz. to get on. Uh, yeah, Michael Nimmons is on there. Mike on fire. He's fantastic. Uh, and then we got actually a, a fantastic Forex trader that I know, a young guy uh, from Russia. I don't know if he's watching or not, Sergey. He's, he's just a... Mm, I don't know. Is he the stock, I, is he the stock barracuda, or is that somebody? No, that's uh, he's actually real talk. Uh, okay. -L -T -L -K. Uh, he is fantastic. He's a very smart guy, very uh, bright young guy. He was actually his parents were chased out of Russia uh, by Putin. <laughs> so uh, a lot of interesting stories there that I, uh, I got insight from him. And he is like an economics geek like us. He's going to be on an even better playing field understanding economics than us, Tim, because he started like he's, I think, like he's 19, 20 now. So he's like way be before us, even, you know, when we started to really understand money and uh, finance. So it's, it's just really cool to have all these people uh, as a part of the community. Uh, people are just, uh, you know, talking a lot forth and back, uh, bouncing ideas sometimes. And then we got our own, uh, we got chats for a lot of different topics. As yeah, well, or, or, if no, or if nothing else, if nothing else, we still have the article section. But anyways, I've got my daughter. Yeah. Knocking on the door. I've got to get this up because uh, it has to process. Otherwise, I can't get the next interview done. But we definitely appreciate everybody listening. Uh, you know, make sure that when you see uh, people talk about collateralized debt obligations, that you heard it here first, that you heard it from John Snyson first, and tell your friends. And uh, make sure if you're watching us on, uh, on World Turn Me that you also check out the uh, Liberty Advisor channel because. I'm uh, out of cash. It's over. Yeah. It's game over. Game over. That's that is the solution to everything. That's not even the unconventional policies anymore because that is uh, just old old hat by, by now. But anyways, we'll probably yeah. who knows what this next week will bring. Maybe we'll just do some random pop ins because in order you to mind, yeah. the show. But yeah, so we'll probably just do some random pop ins here here now, uh, making different videos. So make sure to follow us on different platforms. Go over to the Discord and. Uh, but anyways, again, this is Tim Pacho and John Snyson. With the Tim and John show, this is episode number three wrapping up. And uh, yeah, we picked uh, quite the time to really kick this off, uh, you know, because we, we were talking about doing this right before everything went nuts. And so, uh, yeah, just, uh, what, a, what a time to uh, be documenting this. Ongoing yeah, good. Uh, right in the financial crisis 2.0. <laughs> yep. All right. See you guys. Yeah. Have a good one.